Reporting on the games you love by people who love to game. The MMO Reporter Network. Welcome everyone to MMO Reporter, Rift Reporter, Defiance Reporter, all our stuff, uh, coverage of PAX Prime. I'm sitting here with Greg Lobs, Overload UT, the community manager for all of the try-on games. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some different stuff. We're not going to talk about games, but I, I do have one question for you. Right. We're, well, we're going to talk games. We're not going to talk anything specific. Earliest gaming memory. What's your earliest gaming memory? I can totally answer that. I, 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 I'm pretty sure the first video game I ever played was a game called Ernie's Big Splash, which is a Sesame Street game for, I mean, it ran in DOS. And it was a game where you would set up, uh, like Ernie would start on the top, and you could set up a bunch of uh, tiles that would just play different animations. So he'd enter one side and exit another side, and you need another tile there. So if you set it up right, you could make this long path, and then you click play, and you watch Ernie go through like a little slide and then a thing. I don't remember any of the specifics, but like he went through the whole thing. That, I think that was the entire game. I mean, in those days, that's like that's a lot of content. Well, it actually surprises me that there was so many, so much visual content. But that's the earliest gaming memory I can remember. I was probably like six years old, something like that. Um, I should find out when it was. But I, but yes, so that's my earliest gaming memory. So what do you think it is about those first gaming memories? Because I've got the same thing with my dad's old Texas Instrument computer, plugging it into the TV, getting the magazine, typing in the program, right? All that stuff. What do you think it is about those early gaming memories that stick in our mind so much? It's just the first time you play a video game, it's like nothing you've ever done before. You've probably watched TV before you played your video, first video game, and you've probably uh, played some non-electronic game, like a board game or something like that. But there's something about the, 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 you have a screen, and we're talking like the very basics of video games, right? But there's a screen, and you move something, and then something happens on the screen, and you get this like visual, and you know, obviously these days it's like highly visual and stuff, but even we're talking like way back when, there was nothing like it before. It was just so different, and it just sticks with you completely. And um, I think that's why. It's just a, a brand new experience. It's not like TV, and it's not like a board game. It's an entirely new thing. So you got to, you know, you started with Ernie's Big Adventure. I mean, that's a, that's classic, classic start there. Were you more of a, of a console guy as you grew up, or were you more of a PC guy? I was, I would say more of a PC guy, certainly. I mean, I would all, I, for most of, until I was an adult, would call myself a PC gamer. But I also had all the consoles growing up. My dad has, was in video game development since it, basically, since that was an industry. And um, so at home, we always had, uh, we had the NES and the SNES. Actually, I had the Super Famicom, which is the Japanese version of the SNES. Uh, like a year before it came out in America, we 100 percented Super Mario World in Japanese. We didn't know what Yoshi's name was. He didn't have an English name yet, so we called him Dude because kind of the noise he made when you stepped on him. Um, so while I definitely played all those things, I, I was definitely more of a PC gamer at heart because I had my own computer, and so that's where I spent a lot of my time, especially my gaming time. But like, especially in those days, there were the console games. It's not like there were cross-platform things. That wasn't a thing. There was no such thing as cross-platform. You'd go to your NES and you'd play Mario. You'd go to your computer and you'd play uh, uh, Doom or Wolfenstein or whatever it is that you're playing at the time. And there was like almost no overlap. You know, like the, I want to say like probably the first like cross-platform port. There may have been one for the SNES that I can think of. I'm probably way off on the counts, but and so, but but the, that's a very long answer to say PC primarily. So how did you get into the game industry? I remember on a live stream it was mentioned that you were more of an engineer guy to begin with and now moving into community management. So let's start at the beginning of that. How did you get into the gaming industry? Obviously you mentioned it was a family industry, but how did you start? So um, the way it started was I was interested in programming from a very young age. I learned my, my, to do my, write my first programs when I was uh, eight years old. I learned in QBasic and then learned Pascal, and then I spent a lot of my teenage years in Unreal Script, writing mods for Unreal Tournament. Um, and so I always thought that I wanted to be an engineer in the games industry. And uh, before I graduated high school, an opportunity came up for me to do IT work um, for a, a small startup game developer that I worked for, so, and, and I got the job. My dad worked there at the time, which may have helped a little bit, um, but so I basically did part-time IT work. I was the only IT guy there. We're talking a really small company. But then um, 
when I graduated uh, high school, they offered, they said, well, uh, if you want your job to go full time, you can go full time. You know, we need more uh, IT time. So I did that and then uh, evolved quickly into doing associate producing um, work on our uh, on the, the, the other titles that we ended up working on. That company went defunct, but then but that's how that's how I got started. And then I was faced with a decision. I was faced with a decision when I graduated high school because what a lot of people don't know is I didn't go to college. And that's because I always wanted to be in the games industry. It's a hard industry to get into. And I was I had a full-time job offer in the games industry, or I could quit that job and go to school full-time. And I was like, well, for now, I'm, I'm going to take the full-time job in the games industry. It's really hard to get into. I'm already there where I want to be. Why don't I just continue that? So then I went from game job to game job and ended up uh, as an engineer at um, 2K Sports. So I was doing build engineering. And it was while I was there that Elizabeth, who, um, who you guys probably all know as well, um, uh, had um, uh, messaged me. She, we, we, she kind of knew me from online and said, we have this job opening that I think you might actually be good for because it was a community management job for civilization. And, uh, but there was a specific need for it to be someone that had programming experience. Uh, it was a need that kind of went away. They didn't actually need it. When I, after I got the job, but when I was originally hired, that was going to be a big part of the job. So they were looking for someone that, that was an engineer that could also do the community management part of it. And um, it was a, kind of a, a bizarre choice for me to even make. Like, no, everyone's surprised when they say, you were an engineer and then went into like social media marketing. And yeah, it's really weird, except I've loved it. I, I started doing the job and I was like, I really, really like this. I like interfacing with the fans. Live streaming wasn't even a part of my job until couple years in and, and and I just took to that as well it's just I, I was like I found this passion that I didn't even realize was there I, I'm in the games industry I get to represent the games and I get to talk to the fans and I you know I, I un, yeah I could go on and on and on I, I will be very long-winded if you don't stop me in case you haven't noticed but that is the long story of how I ended up where I am now starting with learning programming at eight years old so speaking of live streaming, I've been lucky enough uh, a couple times to watch your pen and paper role-playing live streams. And I have to say, as a pen and paper geek at heart, that is where my passion for MMOs started because I was trying to recreate that, that experience of pen and paper in a virtual world where, you know, uh, all my friends from high school, we moved to different towns, but here we could play an MMO together. And that kind of filled that, that, that role for us. Um, I have an absolute passion for a gaming system from Palladium Books. Have you ever played uh, Rifts from Palladium Books? I have not played Rifts. Um, I know of it. I know of almost all the tabletop role-playing systems out there. I've played uh, a large number of them, but it's never enough. It's always going to be this much compared to how many there are. Um, like Rifts and GURPS are two of the really big systems that I have not played. Um, spent most of my tabletop role-playing career playing Dungeons and Dragons, although I've moved on from that now. Um, so I have not played Rifts specifically. I, I had to ask. It's just that's that's my my little I thing. Even, I even have a bunch of the books in my like attic because a friend gave them to me when I when I was much younger, and but I've never had a chance. It's just uh, there are too many games. This is this is the embarrassing confession time. Uh, I haven't played a game of pen and paper probably in about 15 years. Still have all my books, that, all of them. Well, that's I mean you should keep and never get rid of them. But that story, the the, the fact that you re you really like pen and play, paper role playing, but you you don't get a chance to play it anymore is so incredibly common. It, like I've said it a million times that the worst part of the entire tabletop role playing genre of games is the fact that it is really difficult to actually play the game. You need to get a group of friends all with the similar interests in real life, hopefully, although you can play online, but it's best in person. And they all have to have similar interests. They all have to have like a good four hour block of availability regularly at the same time that matches with every, and forget it, as, an adult, as a kid, sure, after high school, you go home, that's where most people played tabletop role playing games or in college. But you become an adult and you're, everyone's got different schedules and people get families and it just becomes so hard to play. I'm so lucky but I have a group that we've been playing with for, for four and a half years now, solid. And um, we've had some changes in the players, like some people have left and, and gone, but we've had the same group going in it. But that story of getting to do that is really uncommon, and I think it's tragic, and it's one reason we live stream our games, because 
people watch us. And we a ton of our regular fans are people that they wish they could be playing instead of watching us. And we wish they could be playing instead of watching us. But if they can't play and they can at least get a fill of tabletop role playing by watching us, then I then I'm happy. All right, so here's the thing. You've got three games right now at Tryon that are sort of, uh, you know, one's still being westernized with, with Arcage. You've got Rifts. You've got End, uh, End of Nation. <laughs> You've got uh, Defiance. Pick your favorite child here. I know you love them all equally, but you you got to pick your favorite child. You know, parents say they love all their children equally. It's not true. None of it's true. They have their favorites. I think I'd have to go, it's, I'd probably have to go with Rift as my favorite, but I'm really, really excited about Arcage. Um, but I can't read Korean, so all my attempts to play it so far, it, it does detract a little bit when you can't read it. It's why we're spending so much effort making it not Korean, uh, language-wise, not gameplay-wise, but, you know, it, it can be difficult. I mean, I've, I've put some time into it, not a ton, but you're trying to do a quest and we have to walk over to the one of the people who speaks Korean in the office and be like, can you tell me what this says? I can't figure out how to complete this quest. I don't know if I'm supposed to, am I rescuing a cat out of a tree? Like, I, I don't I don't understand. Um, so I'm excited about that, but, but you know, I haven't really dug my heels in. Um, Rift, so Rift is probably my favorite, but only by a slim margin. Um, across all three, I do like them all. Um, but But if you force me to pick one, which you have, I'll pick Rift. We've seen your dueling skills in Defiance on the live streams. Well, now, okay. <laughs> a little bit. There was a little bit of a loaded challenge. Well, he had really good weapons. I had crappy weapons. I also performed very poorly. He would have beaten me anyway. You know, we've all got our excuses. We've all, we, we all go to our crutch. And I will take that excuse to the grave. <laughs> well, thanks so much for spending some time with us here uh, and, and taking time out of, out of PAX. What are you most looking for? I know you're, you're doing your live streams, your work stuff. Putting that aside, something that is not a Tryon-related thing, what are you looking forward to? Uh, just like here at PAX or just in... Here the, at PAX. Know? Here at PAX. What do, you, what, do okay. you, what do you have to see? What I have to see here at PAX... Well, I'm really intrigued by the Cards Against Humanity uh, booth upstairs. They did a really great job with their booth. If anyone knows what the Cards Against Humanity box looks like, it's just a black box with like white... I think it's Helvetica, just like Cards Against Humanity. Their booth looks like that box. It's larger than life, big, gigantic, black box. No idea what's in it. Just says Cards Against Humanity on all four sides of it. And bravo to them for taking like that that idea of like beauty and simplicity because they've got that going. So like, it's not even that that's the thing I would want to see the most, but it's so intriguing. It's like what's inside the black box. Um, so there's that. Um, I'm also uh, I, I'm interested in just kind of wandering the hall, which I haven't gotten a chance to do yet, just to see what maybe is here that I haven't seen yet. Um, but although I know what it is, what I'm most excited about is the Spelunky uh, panel slash challenge thing. There's a Spelunky thing. Going. I'm a gigantic fan of Spelunky. And they're doing some sort of like live challenge where four very good Spelunky players are all going to play the daily challenge at the same time and compete against each other. And that sounds like a lot of fun. I hope I can make it, but um, I actually don't know when it is. I should find out. I might have already missed it. I don't actually know. I hope I didn't. But that's, that's the, those are the two. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time, and uh, we'll see you in the live streams. All right. Thank you.